You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Ben Franklin's World is a production of Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios. The Continental Congress was a convening that really grew out of many colonists' response to certainly Massachusetts, but others to what had happened in Boston in the aftermath of the Tea Party when Great Britain passed the Coercive Acts or what colonists called the Intolerable Acts. Welcome to episode 396 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. Monday, September 5, 1774. A number of the delegates chosen and appointed by the several colonies and provinces in North America to meet and hold a Congress at Philadelphia assembled at Carpenter's Hall. That statement began the journals of the Continental Congress. The official meeting minutes of the First and Second Continental Congresses and the Confederation Congress. Between September 1774 and March 1789, the congressmen filled 34 printed volumes worth of entries into those journals. Now, the meeting of the First Continental Congress began on September 5, 1774, and it adjourned on October 26, 1774 placing us within this Congress's 250th anniversary. So today, guest host Ashley Bachknight will introduce us to Michael Norris, the executive director of the Carpenters Company of the City and County of Philadelphia and of Carpenters Hall, the meeting place of the First Continental Congress. Now, during our exploration, Michael reveals the origins of the Carpenters Company of Philadelphia and why early Philadelphia carpenters established it. Details about Carpenters Hall, its construction, and why the Carpenters Company rented out their meeting hall, and information about the First Continental Congress, why it met, and what it accomplished before it adjourned on October 26, 1774. But first, did you know that Ben Franklin's World has a listener community? The Ben Franklin's World Facebook group is a place where you can connect and interact with your fellow listeners. You can also stay up to date on some of the latest history news and resources, and you can post your episode requests and your interview questions for our guests. There are even some listeners who have formed a book club that you can join if you'd like to consider the books we discuss on this show more deeply or read other books about early American history. This group is free to join. Just visit benfranklinsworld.com slash Facebook. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash Facebook. I look forward to seeing and speaking with you there. All right, are you ready to dive into the history of Carpenters Hall and the First Continental Congress? Here's Ashley and Michael Norris. Our guest today is the executive director of the Carpenters Company of the City of Philadelphia. As part of his duties, he oversees the Carpenters Company home at Carpenters Hall, which serve as an incubator of early Philadelphia's cultural community, and most famously as the meeting place of the First Continental Congress between September 5th to October 26th, 1774. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Michael Norris. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Now, open in 1771, Carpenters Hall has stood for more than 250 years, and it served as a meeting place for numerous tenants in the arts, sciences, and commerce. It's also been the continuous home of the oldest surviving craft guild in the United States, the Carpenters Company of the City and County of Philadelphia, which was founded 300 years ago in 1724. So, Michael, before we explore the history of Carpenters Hall, could you give us a little bit of background about Carpenters Company and what a craft guild actually is? Well, as you said, the Carpenters Company was founded in 1724. Our name is very long (laughs) because at that time, the city of Philadelphia and the county of Philadelphia were not the same thing as they are today. So this was long before that consolidation happened in the 19th century. So anyway, that's why we are the Carpenters Company of the city and county of Philadelphia. Essentially, we were established as a trade guild in the kind of medieval style of trade guilds that folks may be familiar with were certainly very prevalent in most European cities for all the trades. 
our guild in particular was modeled after the Worshipful Company of Carpenters in London, which dates back to the 1200s. So we're very excited about our being 300 years old, but they kind of have it all over us over there. In any event, the master builders who came to Philadelphia and their successive generations in the early 18th century really wanted to have a guild in that model where the trade could protect its interests, establish best practices, train apprentices, provide mutual aid, you know, and all those things that guilds really did. And the hall was built to be its meeting place and quickly became a meeting place for many other things. But it does continue to serve in that purpose. Today, our visitors are often surprised to learn that the Carpenters Company itself does still exist and is not some weird vestige of the 18th century. Um, And then we actually do have living, breathing members who are really sort of the stewards and owners of the building. So that whole legacy really means a lot to us beyond just the history of what happened here, primarily the First Continental Congress. Now, this particular guild is not new. This concept isn't new. We know that they were hosting guilds, having guilds in other parts of the world, including Europe. So why was this system never fully replicated in the British North American colonies? You know, guilds were actually starting to fade away, right, in the latter part as we went into the colonial period, right? They clearly were a huge presence in Europe in the medieval period. But with the rise of capitalism, with the rise of corporate sort of the entity of private corporations, the need for guilds started to shift right by the time the colonies were being established. And ultimately, in the late 18th century and into the 19th century, some countries in Europe actually banned guilds and the formation of guilds. So that wasn't true in England, where a guild system is actually still very much in place there in the city of London. There are over 100 what are called livery guilds to this day that function as part of the governance of the city of London and continue to support their various trades and crafts. So there never was as dominant a guild presence in the colonies as there was in Europe. And really, it's because even by that point, right, they were starting to lose their influence, although we're a little bit of an exception because in Philadelphia, the Carpenters Company became pretty powerful in the 18th century in terms of what buildings were built where and how they were built. And we had a very tight relationship with fire insurance companies in terms of surveying buildings. And then, of course, the building itself became significant for a very different reason, you know, which allowed the company to continue to exist, you know, through the 19th century and up into today. That's really interesting. I now have a question about the architecture itself. I'm always interested in how things are constructed. So could you give us a little bit of information about the building itself? How was Carpenters Hall constructed? Who was the architect? What can you tell us? So the architect of Carpenters Hall was a gentleman named Robert Smith. He was an immigrant from Scotland who came to Philadelphia in the 1750s, joined the Carpenters Company and became pretty prolific and pretty successful, not just in Philadelphia, where many buildings that he built still stand, not just Carpenters Hall. But he constructed actually sites, at least one site in Williamsburg. The hospital or asylum was built by Robert Smith. He worked at designing Nassau Hall in Princeton. So he was pretty successful. And he designed Carpenters Hall and oversaw construction It's a sort of classic timber frame building with a brick exterior in sort of lovely Georgian style. Everything's perfectly symmetrical. It's built on a square footprint. It's designed as kind of a square cross, which is sort of a metaphor for the idea of a crossroads or a meeting place, right? Which is, of course, what the building is. It was a meeting hall. And the timber frame is still in place. Our original rebel foundation still in place. Most of the brick exterior is original to the original construction. So it really is kind of a gem of Georgian architecture in the U.S. Thank you for the background information on the architecture. So according to the timeline on the Carpenters Company website, the Carpenters Hall always served a number of people, just a variety of different tenants. Could you give us a little bit of information about who used the Carpenters Hall and how they used the space? 
Yeah, tenants were always part of the building, really from the very beginning, even before the First Continental Congress, which was shortly after the building was completed, the library company moved in. The Carpenters Company had raised money to build the building by doing a subscription or, you know, sort of getting loans from members in order to fund the construction of the building. And those loans, you know, had to be paid back, right? So one of the ways the company could generate revenue was by renting the space out. And because it was a sort of secular, non-governmental, non-religious building, it wasn't someone's home. It was a place to have meetings, right? So it got used a lot for that. So our minutes of the company record, oh gosh, probably over 60 different kinds of tenants in the colonial period and in the 19th century. And those include things like First City Troop, which was a Philadelphia cavalry unit that organized itself just prior to the revolution. They had their organizing meetings in Carpenters Hall many what became actually sort of trade unions in the 19th century, again, had their organizing meetings. So things like the Hatters and the Bricklayers and the Cabinet Makers, right? All those associations began to use the space for their meetings. We did have some long-term tenants, the library company being one of them, which was in residence for about 17 years in the building. And then in the 19th century, for decades, we rented the first floor out to an auction house, a commercial operation, which actually inadvertently led to a big change in our focus because a visiting congressman wrote disparagingly about the company renting out the space, which was sort of a shrine to democracy or should have been a shrine democracy to a, you know, sort of crass commercial operation like an auction house. So, and an op-ed that he wrote about that ended up being published all over the country. And it prompted the Carpenters Company to cease doing long-term rental leases with tenants and transforming the space into a museum and a historic site. So that actually happened in 1857. So we've been a museum and historic site since that time have not had long-term tenants since then. But of course, we do continue to rent the space out for different functions and corporate receptions and sort of one-off things. And I sort of love that because, again, it makes the space vital and alive and really speaks to its DNA. It's a place for people to meet. That's why it exists. So whether it's us, the company, or whether it's other organizations, it feels right to have the building be used in that way. Auction house, maybe not so much. In the federal period, in the 1790s, when Philadelphia was the U.S. capital, the space was also used by the First Bank of the United States under Alexander Hamilton as Secretary of the Treasurer while their building, which is just across the way from us, was being constructed. Our building was used for the bank to operate while their building was being constructed. And when they moved out later in the 1790s, we had a couple of other banks in residence in the hall. And one of those banks in 1798 was the victim of the first bank robbery in American history, which took place right at Carpenter's Hall, which is kind of wacky enough. But as it turned out, the person who did the bank robbery was a member of the Carpenter's Company. Anyway, so that's a funny story about a tenant that was in the building at that time. Okay, Michael, let's talk about one of these long-term tenants, Benjamin Franklin. You mentioned him earlier in the library company. So help paint a picture for me. How did Benjamin Franklin use this space? So the second floor of Carpenter's Hall was leased to the library company of Philadelphia. They moved into the building in 1773. Prior to that, they were occupying space on the second floor of the West Wing of the State House, what we now call Independence Hall. But it was getting a little crowded up there for the growing collection. So they were looking for a new space. Carpenters Hall was just being built, and they moved the collection over in 1773. And it remained there until 1790, which is when the library company got its own building for the first time, which was just a few blocks away from us. So at that point, they moved out of the hall, but all through the pre-revolutionary, revolutionary period up until 1790, they were in residence on our second floor. So shareholders of the library company would come to the building to check out books, 
Franklin also started the American Philosophical Society, also our neighbors here in the Philadelphia Historic District. And for a time, part of their collection of scientific tools and instruments was also housed in Carpenter's Hall. So we have a pretty strong connection to Franklin. He was not a member of the Carpenter's Company because he was a printer, not a builder or an architect. Robert Smith, who built Carpenter's Hall, actually also built Franklin a series of townhouses just around the corner from us where Franklin lived and worked. Those buildings don't exist anymore. But the American Philosophical Society has a very funny letter that Franklin wrote to Deborah, his wife, from London, complaining about <laughs> Robert Smith as the architect of their house and how long he was taking to build the building. So our members now, who are architects, get a kick out of the fact that even 250 years ago, clients were complaining about how long their architects were taking. <laughs> and then Franklin also is involved in another significant event that actually connects to the library company because in December of 1775, shortly after he returned from London and joined the Second Continental Congress, Franklin and John Jay were assigned the responsibility by the Continental Congress to kind of start to figure out the whole France thing, right? And would France become our ally? And they held a series of secret meetings on the second floor of Carpenter's Hall in December of 1775 with sort of an emissary. Some people call him a spy because it sounds a little more dramatic, but he did actually come here under sort of a secret identity and the war was on, right? So we certainly didn't want Britain to know how or when we were talking to the French. But in any event, the reason they met in Carpenter's Hall was because Franklin had hired a guy to be the librarian of the library company. And that guy was also from France. And they needed someone who could translate and interpret these meetings with the French emissary. So the origins of that alliance with France, the very beginning of that conversation really started with Franklin in Carpenter's Hall. I'm telling you, this information is just prime for a movie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there actually has been a movie. Many years ago, we did sort of a local feature. It was aired on our local public television station that dramatizes those meetings. It's quite fun. December 1775, we were on the cusp of Thomas Paine publishing Common Sense, right? So the revolution was going on. So there was sort of a lot of stuff percolating in Philly, and the movie kind of captures that along with these meetings. So aside from Benjamin Franklin, perhaps one of the most famous tenants of Carpenter's Hall was the First Continental Congress, which you alluded to. So we know that this First Continental Congress convened about 250 years ago on September 5th, 1774. Michael, what was the First Continental Congress and why did they convene in Philadelphia's Carpenter's Hall? The Continental Congress was a convening that really grew out of many colonists' response to certainly Massachusetts, but others to what had happened in Boston in the aftermath of the Tea Party when Great Britain passed the Coercive Acts or what colonists called the Intolerable Acts. And there was a lot of resistance to those acts. They mostly punished Boston for the Tea Party, but they weren't exclusive to Boston. Some of those acts did apply to all the colonies. And there was a sort of a great uproar that these laws were an infringement upon the rights of the colonists as British subjects. So a couple of colonies called for a Congress which was then considered a finite gathering of leaders, what were called deputies. We now call them delegates, but they really called themselves deputies to figure out what to do about that because they didn't want what had happened in Boston in terms of closing the port and bringing in troops and all that. They didn't want that to happen in the other colonies. So Philadelphia was chosen essentially because it's geographically central along the colonial coastline. And Carpenter's Hall was chosen for a couple of reasons. The existence of the library company was one of those reasons. John Adams particularly noted, and other delegates did too, that the existence of the library was kind of a great selling point. The other major venue that was considered was the State House. There was a lot of opposition to that from many of the delegates. Joseph Galloway, who was the president of the Pennsylvania General Assembly, was 
certainly in favor of reconciling with Britain. He ultimately became a very passionate loyalist and fled to England. So a lot of folks didn't want to meet at the State House because of Galloway and because of the sense that it wasn't neutral. City Tavern was another place they considered. And certainly there were lots of out of session conversations that happened at City Tavern, but they ultimately decided not to have the official meetings there because it wasn't sort of private enough. It was a tavern. It was open to the public, right? How could you stop people from listening in or whatever? So Carpenter's Hall was chosen. It had enough space. The library was upstairs. The doors could be locked, the shutters could be closed, right? People were certainly aware that the Congress was happening, but they didn't want a lot of scrutiny day to day in terms of what was actually being said or or discussed. So that's really how the Congress ended up at Carpenter's Hall. And it was there for that whole six week period in the fall of 1774. Okay, Michael, so you mentioned some of the powers of the First Continental Congress. And one of them was the Intolerable Acts. Could you give us a little more information for our listeners what the Intolerable Acts were and why there was so much fear among the colonists surrounding this act? Yeah, so it was a series of acts that, again, were passed after the Boston Tea Party, and they were punitive laws against primarily Boston, but not exclusively. And they did things like there was an act that sort of totally changed the structure of the Massachusetts Colonial Assembly, taking away election of members and turning those into appointments by the colonial governor. There was a quartering act which allowed the British to house soldiers in people's houses or public buildings. And one of the acts was really about sort of justice and juries, and it changed a lot of how juries were chosen and what rights and responsibilities jurors had. You're seeing echoes of things that have long been a part of English common law, right, dating back to the Magna Carta. And obviously, our delegates were very aware of that legal precedent and legal history. And they were certainly very aware of what they perceived as their rights as British subjects and the idea of these laws being enforced on them without any sense of proper diligence or representation approving them was just considered sort of an outrageous act and a violation of their colonial rights. And as I said, while most of them were focused on Massachusetts and Boston, the Quartering Act in particular applied to all the colonies, right? So again, that was a cause for alarm up and down the coast, right? So hence the gathering to sort of figure out what to do about that. Got it. So 11 days after the First Continental Congress started meeting, Paul Revere arrived in Philadelphia from Boston and Watertown, Massachusetts with the Sulphic Resolves. What were the Sulphic Resolves and how did the First Continental Congress respond to them? Thank you for asking that question. Nobody knows that Paul Revere came to Philadelphia during the First Continental Congress. So I'm like on a mission to get that story out there. The Suffolk Resolves were a series of resolutions, right, that were passed by Suffolk County in 1774 in early September. And they did a number of things. They called for a boycott, although that word wasn't used. The word boycott didn't exist until later. But the idea of a non-importation, non-exportation sort of embargo was something that they called for. The Suffolk Resolves called for citizens to sort of arm themselves, which was, again, considered pretty radical as sort of an official act. And they were deemed significant enough as kind of a turning point in the rhetoric and the relationship with England that the folks in Massachusetts wanted the delegates in Philadelphia to know about that, right? And the quickest way to do that at that time, of course, was to send someone by horse to do that, right? Which is exactly what Paul Revere did. So he came to Philadelphia and reported to the delegates about the resolves. Congress voted to sort of endorse the Suffolk resolves. That became part of the sort of official proceedings of the Continental Congress. So I think it did have sort of an escalating effect, right, where the notch had gone up one more level in terms of the sort of tension and the feeling that things were deteriorating, right, and something had to be done. So essentially, this was an economic boycott of goods and trade from places like the UK, Ireland, British West Indies. 
So how did the colonists see a protest like this help to open Boston's port and restore its government? How do they see it happening? The idea was that just the loss of that market, of that trading revenue would wake Parliament up and kind of bring them around to wanting to address the grievances. And the Continental Congress called for creations of systems, enforcement committees, and things like that, right, to actually implement the non-importation and non-exportation. And it was pretty successful for a while. There was a little bit of propaganda that needed to happen because like one of the things that was banned in the embargo was tea, which was, of course, a hugely popular beverage at the time. And citizens had to embrace the fact that they couldn't get tea imported in the ways that they were used to. So the impact of the importation of the embargo and the boycott kind of got superseded by the start of the war itself later on. So the full effect, I think, wasn't sort of exactly realized to their intentions, but it did lead to many colonies had already discussed this idea of a boycott and it was not a new idea, but the First Continental Congress was really where it kind of gelled into a unified strategy that all the colonies ultimately sort of signed on to. So 12 of the 13 colonies were at the First Continental Congress. Georgia did not participate. But after the Congress, Georgia did sort of endorse and accept the terms of the non-importation, non-exportation rules. So it was all 13 colonies were participating, and that was a new thing. Ultimately, that sense of coalition and unity, even though things, at least in terms of the point of view of delegates to the First Continental Congress who were trying to find a peaceful resolution, that didn't quite work out. But what was created was this coalition, this association literally called the Continental Association to enforce this embargo. And that in some ways is kind of the germ of the United States. Right. So that's a pretty important outcome. So we have a question from one of our listeners. Jeremy would like to know about the Continental Association. Would you tell us about the Continental Association and what it was? I mean, it really was a coalition. It was the idea that the colonies were banding together, right? And we're going to coordinate strategy responses in a way that hadn't always worked before, right? There had been Stamp Act Congress, Albany Congress, right? Things had happened before to try to get at this sense of bringing the colonies together, but they hadn't quite gelled or they sort of fizzled out. The Continental Association, which was defined in the document, the Articles of Association, codified that, institutionalized it in a way that was new. And as I said, it sort of became the germ of the United States. Our docents tell our visitors about Abraham Lincoln. In his first inaugural address in 1861, when he is making a case for why it's his job to defend the Union, and this is a month before the Civil War starts, he says the Union predates the Constitution, it predates the Declaration of Independence, and it goes back to the Articles of Association in 1774. So while many of us have maybe never knew the Articles of Association existed, And it was certainly overshadowed by the events of the Revolution and the Declaration of Independence. It was seen as a founding document. That terminology, Continental Association, carried over to the Continental Congress, the Continental Army. And it was originally conceived of as being continental. There was a lot of outreach from the North American colonies to try to get the Canadian colonies and the West Indian colonies to be part of the association. That didn't ultimately work out for various reasons, but what they were trying to do was band together all of the colonies, not just the 13 that we're familiar with. Thank you. So, Michael, one of the legacies scholars point to for the First Continental Congress is that it laid the groundwork for the American War for Independence, right? Would you agree that this is a legacy that should be remembered about the First Continental Congress? And also, are there other legacies that you think we should remember about this group? I think hindsight is twenty twenty there, because at the time, while there was talk of independence, the delegates at the First Continental Congress, which wasn't even called that at the time, right, because it only became the first when there was a second. At the time, it was called the General Congress. 
So they weren't necessarily thinking that far ahead. They were trying to find a diplomatic resolution. They declared their rights as British subjects. They didn't say we're independent. They did a little bit of the sort of Patrick Henry famously said at the First Continental Congress, the distinctions between Virginians and New Englanders are no more. Today, we are all Americans. So again, that idea of unity and coalescing was central and sort of an American identity was part of that. But they weren't trying to separate from England at that point. I think it did pave the way for the revolution in the sense that it built this coalition that was able to figure it out when they needed to. So the final thing that the First Continental Congress did was say, "Okay, we're going to meet again. If our grievances are not addressed, we're going to come together again and figure out what to do from there. Of course, the war started before that second meeting could happen. By the time we get to the second Congress, the main goal is to fight a war, right, and win it and become independent. So obviously, the stakes sort of change dramatically between the two meetings. But I do think it's safe to say that the kind of coalition and the sense of unity and shared identity, which grew out of the First Continental Congress, helped make it easier, right, to wage a war for independence. So, Michael, you mentioned the Second Continental Congress. Can you share with us how that shift happened between the First Continental Congress and then the second? So they, as I said, had called for a second meeting at the end of the first Congress. That meeting was set for May of 1775, again in Philadelphia. So, of course, the war started a few weeks before with Lexington and Concord. So by the time the delegates sort of reassembled in May, the war was already underway. They did relocate the Congress to the State House because it didn't really matter if the space was neutral or not when it was pretty clear that a war was happening and it didn't need to be sort of a secret meeting. And then the Second Continental Congress essentially didn't end until after the revolution, until the Articles of Confederation were put in place. So while the First Congress was defined to be finite and temporary, the second one essentially became the U.S. government. So that just is a different thing. And they had a much bigger scope of work to figure out, right, winning a war and establishing a country. So let's have a little fun, Michael. (laughs) Let's move on to our time warp question. So this is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone would have acted differently. So in your opinion, what might have happened if Carpenter's Hall had not existed? Where would the First Continental Congress have met and would its work and outcome have been different? Oh, that is a really fun question. I'm tempted to say that they would have met at the State House, but I'm not completely sure that that's true. There was a lot of animosity towards Galloway from many of the delegates. And I think they might have decided that the second floor of City Tavern, even though it was kind of quasi-public, would be a better spot than the State House. So would that have changed the outcome? I don't think so. There was already so much energy being focused on these grievances and the violation of colonial rights. And the Congress was obviously trying to respond to that. And I think that still would have been their primary focus and their goal. So I would see the sort of trajectory of events kind of proceeding as they happen. Now, if Lexington and Concord hadn't happened, that's a whole other thing, right? (laughs) But I think for our purposes in 1774, I think they would have sort of ended up at basically the same outcome, even if they were meeting in a different place. So Carpenter's Hall opened in 1771 and is still standing and open for tours, which is incredible. (laughs) Would you tell us what we can see and experience when we visit Carpenter's Hall today? 
Sure. So we're open six days a week. It's free admission. Visitors get to see some of our historic artifacts. We have some furniture that was used during the First Continental Congress. And we have some historic banners that were carried by the Carpenters Company, one of which is connected to the ratification of the Constitution in 1788. So that's kind of cool. We have several sort of reader boards, panels that talk about the history of the Continental Congress, the history of the company. It's not overwhelming, but pretty informative for folks who want to learn. We have docents who are on hand to answer questions and talk to people. We have some wonderful artifacts about the company itself, including a list of all the members of the Carpenters Company dating back to 1724 and continuing up to the present. There's a lot of architectural features inside the building that didn't exist in the 18th century. So another part of our story is that the building changed over time, right? Just as the company grew and changed. And as I said, in the 19th century, when we opened up as a museum, the company felt that the inside of the space needed to be sort of a little fancier and grander. So we have a wonderful Victorian era tile floor some sort of chandeliers and sort of decorative touches that give the space some grandeur and help us convey the fact that you're in a historic site, but it's also a living and breathing meeting space. You can see where the Carpenters Company still meets to this day. So we like the sense that lots of important stuff happened here and it's a wonderful historic space, but it's also still a living and breathing meeting hall. For those of us who aren't able to make it to Philadelphia, does Carpenters Hall have virtual tours and exhibits that can be taken? We do have a couple of things on the website, some video tours and tons of text for the history nerds who love to read. Lots of stuff to read about all the various aspects of the Congress and the company. So that's a really great resource. We have some resources specifically for teachers on the website, treasure hunt, scavenger hunt, stuff like that to try to make it fun. So after we survive this anniversary year, we're going to do some rethinking about some interpretation. And some of that will certainly include some enhanced resources, like a 360 tour and some stuff like that. But we're not completely there yet. But there is a lot on the website that can help people who can't physically visit. Well, Michael, I am one of those self-proclaimed history nerds. So (laughs) this next question equally applies to me as well. If we have more questions about Carpenters Hall, the First Continental Congress, or how we can visit the site, what is the best way to reach out to you? Folks can certainly email me. Happy to get information, questions, resources. My email is Michael Norris, all one word, at Carpenters Hall, all one word, dot org. And yeah, I encourage listeners to reach out if they have something to share or a question to ask. Well, thank you so much, Michael. This has been an absolute pleasure and I've learned so much and I know our listeners are just thrilled and excited to see Carpenters Hall. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. This was fun. The consequences of the Boston Tea Party set in motion the chain of events that led to the meeting of the First and Second Continental Congresses. As Michael noted, Great Britain made an example of Boston and Massachusetts with the Coercive Acts of 1774 a series of four acts that were designed to try and bring parliamentary law and order back to Boston and really all of New England. The first act was the Boston Port Act, an act that largely closed the port of Boston to trade until the Bostonians paid the English East India Company for the 342 chests of tea it destroyed the night of the Boston Tea Party. The second act was the Massachusetts Government Act. This act replaced elected officials of the colony of Massachusetts with government-appointed officials and placed Massachusetts under the governorship of General Thomas Gage. The third act was the Administration of Justice Act. This act allowed British officials accused of capital crimes in Massachusetts to be tried in England or in another colony. And the fourth act was the Quartering Act, which really wasn't meant to punish Massachusetts per se, but was really meant to allow the British military to fix a problem it had experienced during the Seven Years' War, which is that it would have the ability to house its soldiers in unoccupied and public buildings whenever possible at colonial expense. As Michael noted, these acts angered the colonists of Massachusetts and gave colonists in other colonies something to worry about. After all, if Parliament could pass these measures for Massachusetts, 
what was to stop it from passing these measures for New York, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, or even the Carolinas? This was the impetus for the First Continental Congress. Now, Virginia's Committee of Correspondence, which met in Williamsburg, is credited for having issued the original invitation to this Congress. And 12 of her 13 sister colonies took her up on the invitation so that they could try and coordinate action so that similar acts would not be passed for other colonies. But if Virginia issued this invitation, why did it propose Philadelphia as a meeting place? Philadelphia was seen as a central location, a place where everyone from the 13 colonies could get to. Plus, it was also the largest city in the 13 colonies, which meant that it had the facilities to house and feed delegates and places for them to meet. As Michael described, it was really important for the delegates to meet privately and in a non-government building because everyone knew that their meeting was of questionable legality. It was also important that they not offend anyone by holding their meetings in a religious institution. This made Carpenter's Hall, a building designed and built for meetings, a perfect choice for the meeting of the First Continental Congress. Delegates could hold their meetings in private, and they could avoid detractors saying that they were using government meeting space to thwart the British government. Now, as you heard, Carpenter's Hall has a long and rich history, as do the building's owners, the Carpenter's Company of the City and County of Philadelphia. So the next time you're in Philadelphia, you should stop by and visit its space and its museum. Doing so will give you a sense of the meeting place of the First Continental Congress, and it'll give you a feel for the kinds of spaces where early Americans lived, worked, and socialized. You'll find more information about the Carpenter's Company and Carpenter's Hall and how you can visit Carpenter's Hall on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 396. Also on the show notes page, you'll find links and a transcript for everything we talked about today. Again, you can find the show notes page at benfranklinsworld.com slash 396. Where the First Continental Congress wanted to meet in secret, I hope you'll do the opposite and tell everyone you know about Ben Franklin's world, because your word of mouth support is the best way for this show to find new listeners. Production assistance for this podcast comes from my colleagues at Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios, Jordan Hammond, Ashley Bachnight, and Morgan McCullough. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. To discover and listen to their other podcasts, visit airwavemedia.com. Finally, there are so many 250th anniversaries of the American Revolution coming up as we enter this period where the revolution turned into war. So what events and anniversaries would you like to know more about? Send me your answers, liz at benfranklinsworld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios.